elementary aged astronauts, fights with wild tigers, and stop motion horror decades in the making. From slasher flicks to period piece thrillers, these are the sleeper hit movies of 2022. As the horrors of school shootings have become a terrifying and tragic part of everyday reality for American youths, it can be difficult to imagine how to begin to tackle this topic in the context of a movie. In contrast to the tone-deaf stab at relevant showrunners made in the shooting star episode of Glee, the fallout tackles the psychology of a teenager living in the wake of a school shooting with depth and specificity. The teenager in question, Veda Cavell, experiences trauma extending far beyond just the school shooting event itself. Just trying to go back to high school becomes an enormous trial, and her outlets for controlling her anxiety aren't always as healthy as they could be. The remarkable thing about writer-director Megan Park's work on The Fallout is the sheer variety she lends to each of the high schoolers depicted in this story. There's never one way to cope with trauma, and the same can be said for surviving a school shooting. Vader and her friends register as real human beings thanks to the fallout, taking the time to outline the specific and varied ways they're each moving forward in their lives after unspeakable horrors. There isn't... There's no reason? None of us should have died. Meanwhile, the lead performance from Jenna Ortega is remarkable, especially her subtle, detailed depiction of Veda shutting out those around her. The fallout is far from an easy watch, but it's an unflinching and emotionally astute piece of filmmaking. The people we lionize in society are just people like everyone else. It can be easy to forget that in everyday life, but Oscar Fahardi's A Hero, which played at Cannes in 2021 but hit Prime Video in 2022, is a perfect reminder of this truth. The film tells the story of Rahim, played by Amir Jadidi, who was recently released from prison. As he begins to rebuild his life, he returns a bag of money to its rightful owner, making him a hero in the eyes of his neighbors and community. However, Rahim's past comes back to haunt him as dissenting voices begin to question the validity of his actions. Not only does this place his new reputation in danger, but it also begins to eat away at Rahim's ability to secure new employment and stake out a post-prison existence. The same nuance and richly detailed characterizations that Farhadi brought to his 2011 masterpiece A Separation are once again present in A Hero. These intricacies make the ensuing tragedy of the plotline all the more compelling to watch, as does the delicately thoughtful camera work from Farhadi and cinematographer Ali Ghazi. The cinematography is especially unforgettable in the film's closing shot, which leaves viewers with a sense of unshakable despair. Boasting a 96% score on Rotten Tomatoes and bizarrely overlooked for a Best International Feature Oscar nomination, A Hero is another Asghar Farhadi gem that is well worth watching. From AI, artificial intelligence, to Bicentennial Man, there have been plenty of movies navigating the relationship between human families and robotic companions. However, none of them have been quite like After Yang, the latest film from director Koganada. The film chronicles a family led by their father, Jake, played by Colin Farrell, figuring out what to do once their longtime robot Yang abruptly shuts down. While determining the next steps for this mechanical being that was so important to his family, Jake begins to uncover extraordinary things in Yang's memories. This discovery suggests he was even more complex and human than they could have imagined. The contemplative style of filmmaking Koganada applied to his 2017 film Columbus is alive and well in its follow-up, but after Yang is far from a reprise of the director's previous cinematic effort. The ingenious use of shifting aspect ratios paired with Koganada's striking editing techniques gives After Yang a distinct visual identity. Meanwhile, the quiet pieces of unique technology and architecture surrounding the characters suggest a broader near-future world without overwhelming the story. The filmmaking and melancholy ambiance are so captivating that they make this movie feel like the very first film to ever tackle the idea of distinctly human traits lurking inside a robotic being. The tale of Cyrano de Bergerac has been captivating audiences in various mediums for well over a century. However, no one has told this adventurous story in quite the way Joe Wright does in Cyrano. Pleasure to meet you, Cyrano de Bergerac. 
This 2022 film brings the story to life as a musical headlined by Peter Dinklage in the titular role. The story of an expert swordsman who believes himself to be too hideous to be loved by the woman of his dreams, it's a tragic romantic yarn that bursts off the screen with palpable pathos. This is a movie that wears its sentimental belief in old-fashioned love on its sleeve, and it's all the better for such a cynicism-free execution. The straightforward approach to the romance is mirrored by the confident execution of the music, from random conversations punctuated by melody to letters read aloud through lead actor Haley Bennett's sensual crooning, the songs spring from the lips of cast members at any given opportunity. Cyrano has no qualms about beating its own drum, which comes in especially handy during its emotionally devastating musical sequences. Some may find it more hokey than moving, but if you like old-fashioned romantic dramas that throw subtlety and caution to the wind, then Cyrano will deeply move you. In the grand tradition of Rope or Buried, the outfit largely takes place in one location. In this case, that singular backdrop is the clothing store of Cutter Leonard Burling, played by Mark Rylands. He prides himself on making the finest clothes possible for his customers, as well as how he stays out of the way of the mobsters who use his place to hold money and letters. One late night, this shop becomes a hotbed of activity when gangster Richie Boyle is killed by a fellow mobster. Thus begins a night of increasingly dangerous activity that sees this mild-mannered expert in fashion using all his wits to stay alive. Writer and director Graham Moore does fine work utilizing this simple premise in minimalist environments to create an engaging crime thriller. Part of the film's charm comes from Moore's willingness to have dark fun with his material. The R rating provided the filmmaker freedom to include realistic bursts of bloody mayhem and impactful dialogue laden with coarse language. Mark Rylance's years of stage experience serves him well within the confined set, and he manages to keep viewers engaged with minimal resources. Unsurprisingly, the Oscar winner proved the perfect lead for the tense thriller. Some movies only offer excess spectacle but no heart, others merely schmaltz but no scope. RRR, an epic blockbuster hailing from director S.S. Roger Mooley, wisely decides to deliver both of these ingredients at once. This story concerns two men, Komaram Beam and Alori Sitarama Raju in 1920s Delhi. The duo sparks up a deeply passionate friendship without realizing the other's true identity. Beam is on a mission to rescue a young girl who was kidnapped from his village, while Raju is a cop who demonstrates deep loyalty to brutally cruel colonial figures like Governor Scott Buxton. RRR delivers one riotously over-the-top action scene after another. Any pretense towards being grounded has been tossed to the wind in favor of delightfully maximalist chaos. At the same time, there's a genuineness to how Raja Muli depicts the friendship between Beam and Raju that makes it impossible not to get wrapped up in their bond. Depictions of this duo standing strong and fighting back against cruel colonial forces also stir the soul. There's a beating heart to RRR that lends deep humanity to a movie that also features exploding trains and flaming carriages. Tossing in a bevy of remarkably catchy tunes like Natu Natu and RRR becomes a cinematic delight one can't miss. Writer and director Richard Linklater returns to the world of rotoscope filmmaking with Apollo 10 and a half, a space-age childhood. For this production, Linklater splits the story between the real and the fantastical. Part of the runtime is concerned with chronicling the exploits of young Stanley growing up in 1960s Houston, Texas, when the space race was everywhere. The film is somewhat autobiographical for Linklater, and authenticity reverberates off these recollections of the highs and lows of such an important historical period. However, Apollo 10 and a half also ventures into a heightened yarn about Stanley being called in by NASA for a top secret mission where he gets sent to the moon before Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. The combination of the disparate narratives in Apollo 10 and a half is fairly seamless, and it's greatly assisted by Jack Black's wall-to-wall -wall narration, which bridges the gap between Stanley's home life and his voyage to the stars. Okay, pause. Let's forget about all this for now. We'll come back to this part later. Even better, Link later injects amusingly specific details into Stanley's reminiscing about childhood elements, like his uber-paranoid grandmother or how his mom could make one ham dinner last an entire week. The entire story is told through nicely realized hand-drawn animated rotoscoping, a welcome return of an art form Link later used so well on earlier projects like A Scanner Darkly. 
With these qualities, it becomes quite easy to recommend Apollo 10 and a half as a trip worth taking. When director Puna Panahi's Hit the Road begins, it appears that the film will focus on a married couple and their two sons on a road trip across Iran. Slowly but surely though, Panahi peels back the layers on this family and their excursions to reveal deeper, darker truths. This is anything but a normal road trip and it quickly becomes apparent that we're watching an exercise in quiet tragedy masquerading as familial normalcy. The film's power is especially apparent in how each of the lead characters gets a unique and distinctive point of view. The intentionally cramped confines of the narrative allow us time to get to know everyone in this family while the restrained camera work offers subtle glimpses into their interior worlds. Panahi's strengths as a filmmaker are further reinforced by how well he can incorporate bursts of dark humor into Hit the Road without undercutting its ominous tone. Above all else, Pantea Panaya's performance as the unnamed mother of this family may be the ultimate reason to see the film, especially her work in the film's devastating final sequence. Performances like that, just like movies as good as Hit the Road, are far from commonplace. A24's horror fair has often gone in artsy directions, with an emphasis on long stretches of silence, meditative wide shots, and abstract imagery. X, a title from the studio thrust into theaters in March 2022, goes down a different lane, with its horror influences being more in the vein of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. With a 1970s porno shoot as the backdrop, X is a different beast compared to Hereditary or The Witch, but no less well-crafted. Like many of its predecessors, this A24 horror film is a compelling watch. As for the plot, the film follows a group of young filmmakers as they show up at a Texas ranch to make an adult movie. Needless to say, things do not go according to plan. Writer and director Ty West isn't reinventing the mold here, but he doesn't need to. This is a film that conveys a giddy glee in playing with the grisly storytelling hallmarks of the slasher movie genre and getting audiences all riled up with anticipation by overtly teeing up gruesome ways for characters to perish. In between all that fun, there's even an occasionally poignant undercurrent to X about mortality and who modern society deems attractive. These themes add some heft to the proceedings, but if you just want to watch X for the gore and titillation, there's plenty of that to satisfy. X is a departure from the standards of many other scary A24 titles, but following its own creative path serves it mighty well. Gerard Carmichael not only stars in the On the Count of Three, he also makes his directorial debut with this extremely heavy film centered around suicide. Specifically, the film is about lifelong best friends Val, played by Carmichael, and Kevin, played by Christopher Abbott, committing to a pact that they'll kill themselves by the end of the day. It's a brutal and heavy premise told with deftly executed dark humor. I don't listen to Atlantis Morissette when I'm going through a breakup, and I'm not listening to Papa Roach on the day I'm going to kill myself. Much of this comes from how screenwriters Ari Katcher and Ryan Welch pull no punches in trying to make the audience understand these characters and their complex motives. We're always in tune with the deep psychological trauma that's making them believe that suicide is a reasonable option to escape their tormented existences. The empathetic nature of On the Count of Three is especially apparent in the mesmerizing performance by Christopher Abbott as Kevin. A man just barely keeping his long, simmering pain under the surface, Abbott can break your heart with a facial expression, and both he and Carmichael have authentic, lived-in chemistry with one another. On the Count of Three is not an easy watch, far from it, but those who are able to take it in will be gifted with an impressive first foray into filmmaking from Carmichael, as well as one of the year's best performances from Abbott. In her second feature-length directorial effort, director Audrey Dewan delivers an extraordinary piece of cinema in the form of Happening. This production tells the story of Anne, played by Anna Maria Vartolome, a young woman living in France in 1963. Her hefty ambitions for the future get upended when she learns she's pregnant. All Anne wants to do is get an abortion and move on with her future, but abortions are outlawed in France in this era. Now Anne has to sneak around, speaking in secrecy and using subtle glances to reveal her true feelings while keeping her crisis from everyone around her. It's an intense storyline that Dewan brings to life with subtle but impactful power. Among the film's many strengths is Vartolome's performance in the lead role. 
handed a part largely eschewing overt dialogue, Bartolome works wonders in conveying Anne's thought process via quieter means. Dewan's direction is also remarkable, with visual details like a constricted aspect ratio illustrating how confined Anne feels in her day-to-day -day life. All of these thoughtful touches add up to a movie you can't shake off once it's over. Happening isn't just a sign of Dewan's powers as a director, it's also an exceptional ode to what human beings endure in the face of inhumane laws. In production for decades, Mad God is a labor of love from Phil Tippett, an icon of the stop-motion animation industry. It's a miracle this film ever managed to see the light of day, considering that it took crowdsourcing to get the funds necessary to bring this warped vision to life. All of that time, effort, and money were spent on a feature that largely eschews plot in favor of delivering increasingly disturbing visions of a post-apocalyptic world where suffering is omnipresent. Doctors deprive people of their guts rather than save anyone while husks of human beings are created often solely to die in the abyss. Mad God isn't just dark, it's relentlessly bleak. While such a tone won't be for everyone, those that can get on Tippett's wavelength will be happy with what Mad God delivers. Running just a hair under 80 minutes before the credits begin, Mad God manages to constantly deliver unpredictable and unnerving imagery brimming with imagination. The various textures provided by the stop-motion medium make the film appear more viscerally appalling and unique. It's hard to comprehend an entirely computer-generated nightmare world like this one being nearly as impactful just as it's difficult to imagine many other 2022 titles being as lastingly chilling as Mad God. If you're going to watch anyone talk in a hotel room for 90 minutes, it might as well be an instantly compelling performer like Emma Thompson. She takes on the role of Nancy Stokes in Good Luck to You, Leo Grand, while Daryl McCormack plays the titular part of a male sex worker. After her husband passes away, Nancy decides to finally engage in the sexual exploits that have been a mystery to her for decades, hiring Leo for an hour or two of passion. Number three, we do a 69, if that's what it's still called. Uh, I don't know. Um, four, me on top. Five, doggy style. What sounds like a simple arrangement becomes anything but as Stokes begins to open up more and more to Grant. Katie Brand's screenplay ensures that the dialogue between these two characters is as humorous as it is revealing. The boldly intimate scope of the project, which is largely confined to one hotel room, proves to be a boon to good luck to you, Leo Grant, offering viewers a chance to understand the finer nuances of this duo without any distractions. What's more, the film allows moviegoers the opportunity to appreciate the exceptional lead performances by Thompson and McCormack. Good luck to you, Leo Grand is the newest reminder that you don't need an enormous story to make an engrossing movie. One of the first scenes in Neptune Frost depicts people chanting and banging on drums in the grim domain of a mine where a worker has just perished. These performers are an aberration in this environment, but that's the point. Within this sequence, Neptune Frost has established that music can appear anywhere. The same is true for things like the spirit of rebellion, empathy towards other human beings, and one's true identity. No matter how much oppressive societies try to stifle or even wipe out these forces, they will endure. Hinging on this concept, Neptune Frost reveals itself to be a stirring battle cry in cinematic form. Directors Saul Williams and Anisha Uziman tell the tale of Neptune, played by both Elvis Ngabo and Cheryl Isheja, who joins a hacking initiative. There's a visual audacity, particularly when it comes to costume and production design. In fact, this might be the only film to feature a major character in an outfit made completely out of keyboard keys. Such elements reflect how this film focuses on a collection of human beings who can finally be themselves away from oppressive systemic forces. Insightful dialogue by the film's protagonist reinforces the movie's touching exploration of individuals finally discovering the space to embrace their own identity. There's a beating, captivating heart to Neptune Frost, which informs its ceaseless creativity and unwavering rebellion against fascism. Even the most jaded viewers won't be able to resist something this stirring. The way racism is ingrained into the fabric of America and its institutions is such an overwhelming part of reality that even beginning to approach it in film can intimidate filmmakers. 
The documentary Who We Are, a chronicle of racism in America, hailing from directors Emily and Sarah Kuntzler, provides an expansive look at the past and present of racism's impact on the U.S. The story is told through the words of ACLU Deputy Legal Director Jeffrey Robinson. The film split between clips of him giving a talk about the history of America's racism to a packed crowd and segments depicting Robinson talking to various American citizens about this urgently relevant topic. Who We Are is a heavy watch, as it should be. The filmmakers and Robinson refuse to distill the horrors of bigotry to just flat readings of statistics. There's a passionate fervor in Robinson's public speaking skills as he dives into the nuances of how racism has informed key parts of America's foundation. Who controls the past controls the future and your children, they are being taught that slavery was a side issue in the Civil War. Meanwhile, his interviews remind viewers of the human cost of systemic racism being normalized. The overwhelming reality of intolerance in America is superbly reflected within the lens of who we are.